welcome back to a news bulletin. In the deadliest day since the coronavirus outbreak, over 1,000 people have died in the U.S. and Spain each. The U.S. has reported 1169 deaths, while over 1,000 people have died in Spain in the last 24 hours. Globally, the number of infections has crossed 1 million, and the death toll is at 53,179. Details in this report. The COVID-19 pandemic is swamping health systems, threatening lives and livelihoods across the globe. Kyrgyzstan has reported its first fatality from the virus, while the US, Spain and Italy continue losing hundreds of lives every day. Britain has promised a tenfold increase in the number of daily tests after the government faced criticism for failing to roll out mass checks. The new national effort for testing will ensure that we can get tests for everyone who needs them. And I'm delighted that the pharmaceutical industry is rising to this challenge and putting unprecedented resources into testing. Taken together, I am now setting the goal of 100,000 tests per day by the end of this month. That is the goal, and I am determined that we will get there. Russia's President Vladimir Putin has extended the duration of paid non-working period in the country till 30th April. While Australia says its healthcare system can cope with the pandemic, the doctors in the catastrophe hit Spain are devastated. Right now, nothing indicates the scenario has changed and that we need to go up to the second level. For the time being, everything remains the same. But in any case, as I said yesterday, there is constant evaluation as we receive information and there is close coordination with the regions. The World Health Organization says there should be a global push to help poorer countries fight the pandemic or it will circle back to the entire world. The SARC has backed Pakistan's proposal for a video conference of the health ministers of the bloc on COVID-19. The bloc Secretary General Isala Ruwan Varakun appreciated the proposal during a phone call with Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi. The Foreign Officer Varakun and Qureshi agreed on the need for joint efforts for fighting the coronavirus pandemic. Pakistan has been pushing the idea since India hosted a video conference of the SARC leaders on March 15th. Meanwhile, infection cases in Pakistan have increased to 2450 with 126 recoveries. In the last 24 hours, four people have died, raising the total to 35. The province of Punjab leads in cases number with 920 infected people. Sindh has declared a complete lockdown for three hours today as infections rose to 783. Pakistan has criticized India's ruling Bharatiya Janata Party for its Islamophobic ideology. In a tweet, Prime Minister Imran Khan said the BJP leadership speaks about 200 million Muslims, just as the German Nazis spoke about the Jews. Prime Minister Khan was referring to an interview given by BJP parliamentarian Subramanian Swami. Swami said Muslims are not equal in India and where Muslim population is large, there is trouble. He was supposedly justifying an ongoing human rights crisis in India where Muslims are treated like second-class citizens. Meanwhile, in another inhumane act, police in Indian-occupied Kashmir have announced to arrest anyone who speaks up against the domicile law. On Wednesday, New Delhi enforced the new domicile law for government jobs in the territory. The law allows citizenship of disputed territory to anyone with 15 years' stay in the valley which is a violation of international law and UN resolutions. Pakistan has apprised UN chief about India's belligerent move of introducing new domicile rules in occupied Kashmir. In a telephone call with Antonio Guterres, Foreign Minister Shah Mahmood Qureshi said, India's move is a blatant violation of the Fourth Geneva Convention. He said the UN and the international community must take steps to prevent India from changing the demography of the occupied valley. Qureshi also discussed ways to mitigate coronavirus. He hailed the Secretary General's initiative of establishing an emergency fund of $2 billion for COVID-19 response. Meanwhile, Qureshi also discussed coronavirus measures with his UAE counterpart, Sheikh Abdullah bin Zayed Al Nahyan.
In other news, the U.S. has expressed concerns over a shift of Afghanistan's financial matters to the presidential office. U.S. envoy for South Asian affairs Alice Wells said Afghans need accountable government. She said the government is putting the key constituents of financial matters under the presidential palace. Wells was referring to a report published by U.S. Institute of Peace. The report says the Kabul administration is eviscerating the finance ministry and gravely weakening one of the country's most effective institutions. It said the move will jeopardize the sustainability of peace if an agreement is reached with the Taliban. Meanwhile, the World Bank has approved $100 million aid for Afghanistan for the fight against COVID-19. The bank said the fund is part of the emergency response and health systems preparedness project of the institution. Libya's UN-recognized government of national accord says it has killed 20 militants of Khalifa Haftar's led Eastern forces. GNA-led Burkan al-Rabab operation spokesman Mustafa al-Muji says the militia members were killed in an airstrike in Serte city. Officials said the GNA forces have ramped up the operation and cleared several frontline positions in Tripoli and Serte cities. GNA said other air force strikes hit Haftar's forces positions on al-Vishka frontline. Since April last year, Libya has been torn apart by a civil war between the GNA and the Libyan National Army. Turkey says it has killed 10 militants of the Kurdistan Workers' Party in northern Syria. The Defense Ministry says the fighters were killed during Operation Peace Spring in the region. The ministry said it will not stop the operations against militants in the region. Yesterday, Turkey killed 14 PKK militants during Operation Euphrates Shield. Since 2016, Turkey has launched a trio of operations across its border into northern Syria. Ankara holds the fighter group responsible for the deaths of some 40,000 people in a 30-year conflict. Syria says two people have been killed while four others wounded in shelling by Turkey-backed rebels in Hasaka, northwestern countryside. State media said the rebels launched an attack with rocket shells against civilians' houses in the villages of Qabir Sagir and al Abush in Tel Tamir. It said three civilians were wounded in rebels' mortar attack on the village of Rabayat. Earlier, government officials said the rebel forces are violating a truce deal brokered between Turkey and Russia. They said the rebels have breached the cessation of hostilities agreement for several times in a week. Last month in Moscow, Turkey and Russia reached an agreement to cease fire and start joint patrolling on a key border highway. More from the Middle East. Lebanon has lodged a complaint to the United Nations against Israel for violating the country's airspace. The complaint was filed after three Israeli warplanes flew over Lebanese airspace to launch missiles on the Syrian central province of Homs. In a statement, the foreign ministry urged the Security Council to put a permanent end to the Israeli violations as they threaten the safety of the Lebanese people. It said Tel Aviv violates the Lebanese aerial, maritime and territorial sovereignty on a daily basis. On Tuesday, Syrian state media said Israeli warplanes fired missiles over Lebanese airspace. The outlet said the warplanes targeted a Syrian army position without mentioning the exact location. Moving on, UN General Assembly has unanimously adopted a resolution calling for increased global solidarity and international cooperation against the COVID-19 pandemic. This is the first UN resolution on the outbreak coming after the number of coronavirus cases surpassed 1 million worldwide. The resolution was prepared by Norway, Switzerland, Singapore, Indonesia, Liechtenstein and Ghana and sponsored by 188 countries. The resolution emphasized on the need for assistance to the poor and the most affected countries. The resolution highlighted the need to respect human rights and oppose any form of discrimination, racism and xenophobia in response to the coronavirus. The U.S. has fired a commander for raising alarm over Navy's incompetence in containing coronavirus on board aircraft carrier Theodore Roosevelt. In a letter, Captain Brad Cozier urged his superiors to act to prevent U.S. troops dying 
outside of wartime. Acting U.S. Navy Secretary Thomas Maudley said the commander exercised extremely poor judgment. Maudley said the captain was being fired for allegedly leaking the letter to the media, which created the impression the Navy was not responding to his questions. 114 of the more than 4,000 crew members have tested positive for COVID-19. Meanwhile, U.S. President Donald Trump has invoked the Defense Production Act to aid companies building ventilators for coronavirus patients. Last week, Trump first invoked the emergency powers to compel auto giant General Motors to produce ventilators. In the U.S., Democratic National Committee has postponed its nominating convention from July to August over the coronavirus pandemic. DNC officials said the convention will now be held on 17th August in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, about a week before the Republican Party's convention. The postponement comes days after Joe Biden called for the convention to be moved due to the coronavirus. Meanwhile, Wisconsin officials plowed ahead with plans for a presidential primary next week despite challenges amid the pandemic. The state's Democratic governor and Republican-controlled legislature have not moved to delay the primary and local elections scheduled for Tuesday. We have a lot more coming up right after this short break, so stay tuned. Welcome back. Germany has warned of unspecified countries abusing the coronavirus crisis for their own propaganda and for spreading fake news. In a virtual statement, Foreign Minister Heiko Maas said it is appropriate to take countermeasures to fend off such attempts. Maas was speaking in Berlin ahead of a video conference meeting with his counterparts from other NATO members. Maas did not name the countries after being asked how the current crisis changed the relationship with China and Russia. According to an EU document, Russian media deployed a disinformation campaign against the West to worsen the impact of the coronavirus. The Kremlin denied the allegations, saying they were unfounded. What we are warning about and what we need to discuss at today's NATO meeting and what we already talked about on an EU level is that some are abusing the situation for propaganda purposes in order to look better. In Australia, New South Wales police have transported health professionals and an independent medical team to the Ruby Princess cruise ship. The team will test the crew members for new coronavirus. The operation is a part of the government's effort to deal with eight cruise ships in Australian waters off the East Coast. Speaking in Sydney, Police Commissioner Mick Fuller said there were nearly 8,500 crew members in ships that needed to be checked. He said, if a small percentage ends up with the virus, it would overwhelm the country's health system. Meanwhile, Australia's science agency has started trials on ferrets to produce a vaccine against the novel coronavirus. The Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization said the testing is likely to take three months. The move comes after the country reported over 5,000 confirmed cases with a total of 24 deaths. China says it is ready to support and assist Indonesia in order to jointly overcome the COVID-19 pandemic. President Xi Jinping said this in a phone conversation with his Indonesian counterpart, Yoko Widodo. On behalf of the Chinese government and people, President Xi expressed condolences to the India Indonesian government and people on the pandemic. Joko said that under President Xi's leadership, Chinese people made important achievements in the fight against the pandemic and the world should learn from it. Meanwhile, President Xi said China is willing to help Belgium overcome the current shortage of medical supplies. In a telephone conversation with King Philippe of Belgium, President Xi said China is ready to share useful COVID-19 prevention and control experience with Brussels. European Commission Chief Ursula von der Leyen has expressed concern over coronavirus measures taken by Hungary, saying they went too far. Hungary's parliament on Monday granted Prime Minister Viktor Orban an open-ended right to rule by decree. In a news conference, von der Leyen said Hungary's measures should be limited in time and subject to scrutiny. 
More than a dozen EU member states, including Germany, Spain and France, have expressed concern. The new law could be used to muzzle journalists critical of Orban. Meanwhile, the Czech member of the Executive Commission, Vera Jurora, said this is the time to kill coronavirus, not to kill democracy. She said, when governments gain more powers to manage a crisis, they should be under democratic control. In the U.S., a man who derailed a train near the Navy hospital ship Mercy docked in Los Angeles faces up to 20 years in jail. The U.S. Attorney's Office says the man was identified as 44-year-old Eduardo Moreno. In a statement released by the office, he admitted in two separate interviews that he intentionally derailed and crashed the train near the Mercy. The train ran off the end of the track and through barriers before stopping about 230 meters away from the ship. Getting an education has been an increasingly difficult task for Syrian children since the country was plunged into a civil war 10 years ago. Now, the coronavirus pandemic has complicated things further as people fleeing violence struggle to find ways to self-isolate in jam-packed refugee camps. Some determined teachers have turned to WhatsApp to keep their classes going. Let's find out more in this report. For children in war zones, the disruption of school is usually the first indication that something has gone terribly wrong in their country. Volunteers had tried to restore some semblance of normalcy for the children of northwestern Syria by setting up schools in tents. But these can no longer continue amid the global coronavirus pandemic which has now made its way to this war-torn country. In an effort to keep classes going, volunteer teacher Ahmad Hadaja had turned to giving lessons via WhatsApp. For corona, ija... Coronavirus is dangerous, so we try to ban students from gatherings. We try to deliver the lesson in their own tent via WhatsApp groups. It is not an effective way to make the student understand his lessons, but at least it covers 70% of the lessons that were delivered in the tents in front of the students. Working with five other teachers, Hadaja sends video lessons and homework to parents' phones for the children to work through. One father says the method isn't ideal, but it's better than nothing. I can evaluate it by 70% as the boy is learning by 70%. But it is different when the teacher is working in front of the student at his school. Teachers initiated this initiative so that students continue their studies until this dangerous virus comes to an end. Doctors fear the worst if the COVID-19 outbreak reaches northwestern Syria, the country's rebel bastion. Test kits have arrived in the area, but there are no confirmed cases yet. From Syria to Bangladesh, tens of millions of refugees in camps and makeshift settlements remain exposed to the coronavirus. In our top business story, U.S. President Donald Trump says he expects Saudi Arabia and Russia to announce a deal on a cut in oil production by up to 15 million barrels a day. In a Twitter post, Trump said he spoke to Saudi Arabia's crown prince in an attempt to defuse a price war between Riyadh and Moscow. Crude prices rose to $25 a barrel after his tweets, which also mentioned a phone call between the crown prince and Russian leader Vladimir Putin. However, the Russian media quoted, the Kremlin as saying that Putin and the Crown Prince did not talk. Saudi Arabia has called for an urgent meeting of OPEC and other countries to discuss the market situation. European Union has announced a $109 billion funding plan to help member states subsidize workers' wages during coronavirus health emergency. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen says member states have to pay a quarter of cash for support to mitigate unemployment risks in an emergency plan. Leyen said every year an EU budget must be activated to help stem the economic shock created by the pandemic. She said all budget rules will be relaxed so the money can reach those that need it as quickly as possible. Leyen said the EU's next long-term budget should emulate U.S. Marshall Plan enacted to help European countries after World War II. This is why we introduced today SURE. SURE is Europe-supported, short-time work. 
It can mitigate the effects of the recession. It keeps people in work. It enables companies to return to the market with renewed vigor. The World Bank has approved a loan of $35 million to help Argentina contain the new coronavirus pandemic. In a joint statement, the World Bank and Argentina's government said the loan will be used to purchase medical supplies. The loan is part of a larger $14 billion package the bank has made available to help countries mitigate the impact of the pandemic. Health Minister Guinness Gonzalez Garcia says with these resources, Argentina will continue to strengthen the response level of its health system. The loan is to be paid back over 32 years with a seven-year grace period. Argentina has reported 1,265 cases of COVID-19 with 37 deaths. European markets are trading lower as another rocky week of trading draws to a close amid coronavirus crisis. Investors are scrambling to sell off their equity positions as fresh data shows Eurozone manufacturing collapsed to an all-time low in March. London's FTSE 100 is trading over 1% lower. CAC 14 Paris has lost about 1%, while Frankfurt's DAX has lost about half a percent. In Asia, Shanghai Composite closed over half a percent lower. Sales Cosby and Nikkei 2 to 5 have fallen flat. Meanwhile, international benchmark Brent crude oil price has surged over 5.5%, shedding early losses. Now let's look at the weather from around the globe. This is all for now. For the latest updates, you can follow us on social media at indus.news.